Kids, howdy and welcome. It is time for Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. That's me. I'm here with Zoe. Hello. It is September 9th. Hey, Zoe. September 9th through the 15th is the week we're in. It's actually a really, really slim week in an epic month or an epic lunar cycle at any rate. Like, so it's going to be sort of funny to grab the things that we're going to talk about today because uh, each week as I approach the pod, I'm looking for certain major things. Like I'm not doing a day-to-day description. You can get that in my, you know, daily astral alerts in my Red Robe Astrology videos. I look for the big chunky things. Now we're in a lunar cycle uh, that includes eclipse season. And so we're not in a slim week energetically. We're just in a slim week in terms of like the major markers of the week kind of slim, but uh, make no mistake about it. We're in, the, uh, we're, we're in a, a version of the wormhole, which I'll talk a little bit about after we take a look at this question. This is from Alexandra. Thank you for your charismatic, informative, insightful show. <laughs> You're welcome. I love, you know, I love reading the compliments. <laughs> My question is about micro versus macro, my individual natal chart and transits affecting it versus just the collective energy of the current transit. For example, the lunar cycle, I understand there is a collective lunar cycle, but if I were to micro this process, I would start each lunar cycle at 25 degrees of Pisces, her natal moon, and have that as my new moon every month, question mark? personal lunar return versus our typical lunar cycle. What are your thoughts versus significance of either or either or the combo as it plays out in real life? Probably didn't articulate that well, but at least I asked. All the best, Alexandra. No, I actually think you articulated that very well. Um, And there's sort of like two things going on here in this question, micro versus macro in a general way, and then a question about the lunar cycle that I want to clear up. There there is a thing called a lunar return, and then there's the lunar cycle, new moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. They are different. They do not relate. They are not a micro and macro of each other. They are completely different animals. So when it comes to the cosmic lunar cycle, you work with that as the lunar cycle for everybody. It's a collective experience. That new moon in any lunar cycle is hitting your chart in a certain way. It's in a certain house in your chart. And the full moon does the same. And every month we move through a cycle and we focus on the collective energy of that cycle because we're all experiencing it very directly. The lunar return is something that happens within the natal chart. Every 28 and a quarter days, the moon will return to where it was at your birth. And that can establish a thing called a lunar return chart. The day of your lunar return, you're likely to feel some sort of way that you know, some kind of ease or gentleness when the moon out there is matching the unconscious, you know, elements of you, because that's what the moon stands for. So in terms of the day that you're in your lunar return, we would interpret that day as one where you're more deeply connected to your own unconscious impulses. But that's got nothing to do with the lunar cycle in the cosmos. It's just a moment that you're in a kind of an alignment, much like your birthday and your solar return that happens once a year. Once a month, we kind of get restored to our factory installation settings of how we relate to the unconscious. So the lunar return is significant. The way it's worked with, if you work with a lunar return, is that you can cast a chart for where the moon is uh, when it's at the exact point in your birth for the current day, 
And that chart and where the planets are at that moment will spell a story or tell a story of what your next month will be, lunar return to lunar return. And one could follow that chart and watch the moon move into each successive house of that lunar return chart, and you would likely see some event in your life that might relate to the house in question, right? So if the moon, you're in your lunar return, and then the moon moves into your natal seventh house of relationship, there might be a relationship dynamic, you know, and then like two days later when it moves into your eighth, there might be something about borrowing money or a change that you didn't see coming that's, you know, deep. I don't work with lunar returns. Like they're too, they're too small. I don't really even work with solar returns, which are the sort of the same thing for our conscious awareness once a year. But they can be interesting to sort of take a look at. And I think there's value in working with them if they speak to you. Me as an astrologer, over the last 30 years that I've been an astrologer, I've dabbled in all of these different techniques, and there are some that grabbed me and some that didn't. I love transits. I love the progress chart, but I'm just not interested in lunar returns or solar returns. But that doesn't mean that they're not rich and juicy. And just again, to sort of repeat, as I always repeat everything twice, at least because I'm a teacher at heart and repetition is helpful. These are distinct experiences where the lunar return is deeply personal and the lunar cycle in the cosmos is a collective experience that all of us tap into directly. You know, I'm going to speak into this just a tiny bit more and combine it with a shameless pluck, <laughs> right? Because I'm teaching transits for the first time in my history as an astrology oh. teacher. And that class is already announced. It starts, I think, at the end of September, three Saturdays. It's Intro to Transits Level 1 where we're going to talk about the geometry of transiting planets, and then we'll do a module on the moon, and then we'll do a module on the sun. Level two will come next year. But if you're sitting and you're listening to this podcast and you're someplace like Alexandra is, where she knows her chart well enough to know her moon placement and is probably ready to expand into seeing exactly how, say, a lunar cycle is going to hit your chart. Right? When you learn how to read the transiting planets as they impact your chart, you take your sense of what's available in a lunar cycle from like zero to 60 just by personalizing it. So back to Alexandra's question about macro and micro, I write a daily column uh, describing the astrology, uh, the daily astro alerts, and many of you see my videos every day. That's the macro. I'm describing the weather that everyone is experiencing. And this is why some days people will see my videos and go, oh my God, you're so accurate. And other days where they won't feel that because we don't always align with the general weather directly in the way that I describe. Everybody experiences it differently. This is another reason to learn how to read your transits, kids. The way I best describe how this works is... What I'm describing is the weather. So I might tell you that it's raining one Thursday. You get to decide whether you want to put on a raincoat and an umbrella or splash in puddles. So we're in this quiet week in what is absolutely not a quiet lunar cycle. Sometimes when big energy is present out there in the form of transits and new moons like we had last week, the quietude that sometimes follows, I, I'll describe as a quiet day or like this, I'm describing this as a quiet week. But that's like, don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean like your life will be quiet. Sometimes when there's less geometry hitting us, we kind of reverberate more intensely, not less intensely. An image I came up with in the last year that I've written several times in my column to describe this, I might even have used this analogy here on the podcast, 
It's like in my CrossFit days, everybody's doing the same workout, right? It's prescribed. You walk in and an hour later you're done and everyone's doing the same workout, but everybody's different in how, how old they are, what their fitness level is and how, how hard they push themselves. Then the workout ends. It's over. That's like transits happening, but passing us by. And now we're in the quietude of the week that I'm talking about, or like a day that I call a quiet day. Everybody's responding to that workout differently. You know, some people have plots on the floor. Some people are so gung ho, they're ready to take on another like running of a mile. You know, some people are covered with sweat. Some, some people are glowing because it didn't work that hard. You know, that's what happens in quiet times is it's like we can get more intensely vibrating <laughs> because there's nothing new to distract us or to grab us into some new experience energetically. And that might be part of how this week plays out. Mercury has just moved into Virgo. And we'll spend about two and a half weeks here till uh, the September the 26th, right? So we're uh, almost out of the entire cycle he's just coming out of. That ends this Wednesday. On Wednesday, the 11th, Mercury comes to four degrees of Virgo, which is where he started his retrograde cycle uh, back in on August 5th, right? So we're done. Mercury's uh, uh, in two months of what's called free and clear status, meaning no retrograde in sight. This is kind of regular, right? Mercury basically spends like two months clear, two months doing the backwards motion thing. Um, and that happens, you know, like clockwork. So for the next two months, anything that you plan or schedule won't have the same guarantees of potential bumps and delays because Mercury is direct. Um, because he's in Virgo right now, communication is strong and precise. It's one of his home turfs. Uh, Mercury rules Virgo and Gemini. So communication's really clear and precise for the next couple of weeks and certainly all of this week. Mars has just moved into Cancer and will be there till like early November. Now that's going to make this eclipse season a little bumpier because Mars rules how we are responding to energy in a physical way. You know, Mars is about behavior and choices and actions. So if we're in an amplified wormhole of an eclipse where we're transforming and things are happening at a kind of fast pace, to have the planet of action in a sign he's not happy in where there's too much inhibition and water for the planet of fire and action to be comfortable in, that's going to have an energetic impact with how we meet the eclipses. So just try to keep that in mind. And if this is too abstract for you, I'm letting you know that Mars has been in Cancer now long enough for you to acclimate to what that sensation is. So you just, you close your eyes and you ask yourself, how has it felt for the last handful of days to make choices, to treat my body in the way that it wants each day and get a sense of what Mars's passage through cancer is bringing you? Because just know it's going to be part of the entire month's bumpiness is that we might be struggling with anger, not being able to express ourselves directly. There tends to be more passive aggression when anger rises up and Mars is in cancer. There tends to be more domestic violence. I read what? that uh, uh, study once that Mars in cancer, you know, correlates to, you know, greater numbers of, of reportage of domestic violence. I wish I had the research that I saw like once upon a time because I hope I'm, I hope I'm speaking something that's accurate. I, I do remember reading that, but it was like, you know, 15 years ago. So just be looking for how you understand your body's response to Mars in this sign because it's going to impact the month. Um, and by the way, he's going to retrograde here. So uh, um, he's going to move into Leo in the coming months and then retrograde back into Cancer. That's, uh, we, we got a few months before we have to worry about that. Venus is in Libra till the 22nd. That's going to be our saving grace for the next two weeks. Um, because Venus is at home here, it's one of her ruling signs, so we are more balanced and harmonious in our emotional bodies when Venus is in one of her most favorite places to be.
So this is going to bona fide be like the shortest podcast episode in the history of us. How long have we been doing this? What episode is this? 165. Okay, that first of all, that's amazing. We've been doing this for 165 weeks. And I'm not going to like push more shit into the podcast just to make the time hit, right? It's just, it's a slim week. That's what I talk about. We've got a dream to share. Uh, um, and that'll round out the, uh, um, the podcast episode. But just now we got, you know, our first eclipse next week. So meet me back here Sunday night. Um, here's another little like opportunity for you. That's a minor shameless plug. I write this daily subscription series called the Daily Astro Alerts. They are very comprehensive. And the videos I make on social media are simply based on that written description. If you want to learn about astrology, subscribe to the Daily Astro Alerts. It's one of the best ways to see what's happening and get language that matches it and increase your astrological knowledge. But I give this away for free to everybody every eclipse season. So go to michaelennox.com. If you don't get announcements from me on a regular basis, then you are not on my mailing list. Go to michaelennox.com, scroll down and find the way to join my newsletter mailing list, and you will get two weeks of free daily astro alerts just when you're going to need it the most when we're in that rocky wild ride between eclipses, and this starts next week. So dig in, enjoy the quiet week, understand that next week we're moving into equinox and the first eclipse, and for the next certainly couple of weeks, we are in really intense energy. Uh, Try to enjoy the quietude if you feel it that way, and just know we're in for an epic releasing of the past eclipse season, which I'll be talking all about in next week's episode. Meanwhile, have at it. Did you know that Michael has a daily astro alert? If you enjoy hearing the weekly astrology, you might like knowing more about each day. When you subscribe for the daily astro alerts, you'll get an in-depth explanation of the day's astrology sent right to your email. Subscriptions are only $10 a month, or you can purchase the yearly subscription at the reduced price of $100. To subscribe, head over to michaelennox.com. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelennox.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. This week we have an email in dream, um, and this is from Gia. Gia says, I forget how the dream initially started, but I'm with a former friend who I'm now definitely not friends with. If she was on (laughs) fire, (laughs) listen to this description. If she was on fire and I had a bottle of water, I would drink the water. (laughs) And (laughs) (laughs) okay, so this is odd that this girl is. Yeah, 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 got it. No, no, I love love having the distinction, right? Because that kind of uh, passion. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And so she says that she's about to go into labor and goes to the hospital alone. We're not friends anymore in the dream either, but I tell her I'm going to come to support her. As I'm driving around a parking lot looking for a space to park, There's a rough-looking open gravel lot farther from the building, a handicapped spot, and one open spot next to the handicapped spot. I pass that one and circle around to find something better. By the time I come back, that spot is taken, so I park in the gravel lot. I walk inside and I enter what looks like an empty parking garage leading up to a hallway of different glass elevators. First, I walk by a family with young kids. 
ignoring them and looking for the right elevator. There's gardens inside here filled with different kinds of bushes and small trees. I come across a mouse with six tails. This is what I thought was interesting. Yeah. I come across a mouse with six tails. I pick it up and carry it around with me and decide to go show the kids from the family I passed earlier. They think it's cool, but quickly lose interest and go on their way. I feel disappointed they didn't think it was as cool as I did. And I went on my way. First looking for a good spot to return the mouse, I couldn't decide where the, where the best place was. Every time I found a spot, an employee would need to use it as I was about to drop the mouse. And I was worried for its safety if someone else found it. Eventually, I found a bushy area to leave it and it scurried off. I get to the elevator hall and can't decide which one to go into. The elevators all drop down from above instead of the doors just opening and closing. There are signs labeling which elevator goes where, but they move too quickly and it looks like gibberish. The lobby gets busy, mainly with employees going in and out. I try to look like I'm lost and need help, but I don't directly ask for directions, and I never choose an elevator. That's the end of the dream. Gia. Wow. So it's a, what, it's a bit long. Um, it's a bit long, but it's juicy. I, I don't know what I mean yet by what I'm about to say, but okay. the whole meaning of the law of the dream for me is in that last sentence. I try to look lost, and I never ask for direction. That... Yeah, sounded like, like so. Right like there, it's it like something. okay, you know, we go on a journey in the dream, obviously, and then where we land, um, you know, the opening of a dream and the ending of a dream are often a little juicy, right? The opening of the dream tells us, you know, everything about what we're exploring, and the ending of a dream, not always, but the ending of the dream can have some salient information as well, and this one does because there's some conflict that gets unresolved in the dream, but we're left with it. We're left with oh, she can't ask for what she needs and is sort of passive aggressively trying to get some help and assistance. I, I need help, but I can't ask you for it. So if I pretend and I look sad enough, <laughs> you maybe you'll notice. <laughs> so then it just right. then that that points an arrow back to the friendship. That was also kind of testy. Well, we don't know because Gina's not here to sort of share with us like why the friendship ended, but we're very clear that it's over. And, <laughs> and if there's any burnt ashes anywhere, there's definitely a, a bottle of water that's been drunk. So because we know that the dream has something to do do with the conflict that ended the friendship. How do we know that? Why? Because in waking life, they are uh, no longer connected. And then in the dream, there's dream material that talks about their disconnect, mm -hmm. though there's a willingness to help. So the fact that the friend is giving birth or is in labor about to give birth, now that's key. That tells us that whatever Gia is learning right now by bumping up against this experience and this dream, that something is like some lesson, some awareness about why and how the friendship ended and what she is learning, I'm sort of put that in, that what she's learning is some new consciousness that the baby inside the friend that's trying to be born represents. Right, and that now it makes sense that G would be like, "Well, I will support you because of I'm I'm again adding this because it, of this importance. It's important for Gia to support because it's her dream and something new is being born." The parking lot piece is sort of the dream's way of saying, "Hey, stop moving through life. Not that you're handicapped." That parking spot that's near the handicap spot that, that looks good for a moment but then is unavailable, I'm loosely interpreting that to mean, eh, it's not like you're handicapped, but you, you got to stop. You got to go off to the gravel parking lot. You got to go to the far parking lot. That, that emphasizes for me 
there's like a raw need to stop moving and attend to something. That's what mm. parking lots mean, right? Cars are representative of how we move through life. And so if the, if the parking lot is the scene, then the message from the dream is no driving to the next event, stop and do some inner work. And of course, it's the mouse that becomes the, the, the medicine somehow of the dream, right? So we, just back to the, the, the sort of story as I'm telling it of, you know, disconnect, new thing, birthing, got to help and support to find out what the lesson is in the parking garage and the, the gravel one says, don't move so much. The hallway of different glass elevators are like all of the potential choices of where to go next. The fact that she cannot decide which elevator to take, even though there's clear instructions, is also the essence of the dream, that whatever state Gia is in right now There's inner process happening so much so that we've got to go into this still place. And the family with young kids is interesting, right? There's something wholesome about a family with young kids, a garden with bushes and small trees, right? So that, that to me suggests it's kind of sort of a pastoral uh, image of, of, of harmony and, 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 and delight um, and peace. So if... If that's where the mouse is found, then peace is going to happen through this mouse medicine. So how would we then interpret mouse? Mice live in the hidden spaces, right? Mm. They, they, they come out of little holes in the, in the baseboards, in cartoons, if you will. But truly, they are not directly visible to us, but now and then we'll see them peeking out of places, right? And they're not so disgusting as rats, right? So rat medicine would have to do a little bit more with shadow material that's hidden, but somewhat visible, like that gnaw through the wood in the background and carry disease and the plague and, and they live in sewers, right? So rat medicine is about that which is subtle and hidden and shadowy. Mouse medicine is less shadowy. They're not as big. They're not as disgusting. They're not as feared as rats are, but they still represent that sort of capacity to see things on a subtle level, to be compassionate with the journey. And certainly, uh, Gia can look up mouse medicine and get more information than what I'm you know, offering here. The fact that the mouse has six tails then is fascinating. I always well, go to numerology. That's what really caught my eye. Yeah. Well, six is the is the number of relationships. Huh. Think of it as two threes interacting with each other. Like when you have one, you have a singularity. When you split off into two, you have a binary, and that binary can create a transcendent third. So three is the number of that creative, powerful process. Right. When two things create a transcendent third. So then when you add four of structure and five of expression and freedom, you get to six. That's two threes. So six becomes the numerological representation of partnership, friendship, connecting with others in balance and harmony. Mm. So that's fascinating to me that, that the, the mouse had six tails and somehow, and again, I don't know what I even really mean by this. If we look at the park with the bushes and the grass and the trees and the idyllic family and the young kids, the innocent element of that idyllic ideal, not interested in the mouse. Now, I don't really know what to say about that other than the dream tells us that some solution is not working. Some idea of, of Gia's is not being received by her psyche. I, I guess if we're 
talking about a dream that might be about a, a, a friendship that has ended, you know, maybe the giving of the mouse to the young kids is some kind of a desire to fix something and their disinterest says, oh, that ain't the solution. You know, mice are also represent a little bit timidity or meekness, small as a mouse, quiet as a mouse, you know, not trying to make waves. Maybe the mouse represents Gia's quietude or something in hmm. the past, trying to fix it by going back to, I just won't make waves. Again, I'm shooting in the dark here a little bit because the mouse is not wanted. It, she can't interest the kids in it. She can't seem to get it back to where it belongs because employees keep, you know, employees are other thoughts, keep distracting her from, you know, taking care of the mouse. And then we end with this passive aggressive, well, I don't know what the fuck to do. So I'm just going to like look hurt and lost and see if somebody helps me. So without Gia here <laughs> to sort of interact with and, um, and ask about some of the details of the friendship and how my interpretation might be fitting in to her story, this is sort of the best I could do. But it is indeed a juicy and fascinating dream. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.